So this is called a butt splice? Yes. Gotcha, okay. It's a one-purpose tool. It is a one-purpose tool, but good luck doing that with anything else. Time to turn the power back on, guys. We got the interlock installed, so everything is the way it should be now. So now, when we turn this panel off, this panel will actually be protected Perfect. Good stuff. The good news is Alyssa didn't lose internet because the cabin's still off grid. Thank you. Thanks for the help. We're back in business. And I have a fly stuck in my shoe. A fly in your shoe? Yes. Is that like a snake in your boot? Yeah, so we just basically used a butt splice in this huge clampy thing and we extended the hots which was nice. So the ground is on a bus, so it doesn't really matter. And we're able to extend the hots around. So now we have like a big loopy loop nice. in the panel, but the generator interlock works. Cool. So now we can't kill ourselves. Well, Good. with electricity anyway. Yeah. How's Seymour Jr.? Seymour Jr. doubled overnight. Holy cow, look at Can that. Can you tell? Remember it was up to the first joint on my middle finger and yeah. now it's up to... Whoa, up to, look at that. It like more than doubled, so it was, yeah. just, it was hungry. We just completed another feeding, so this time I fed it two cups of flour and water, but we're up to my middle finger knuckle. I guess oh, that's yeah. about what it was before I fed it, but it's my prediction that tomorrow at this time the sourdough is going to be up to here, and then it's go time. Basically, starting with just a tablespoon, you can grow it to use in multiple recipes in a matter of a week. Nice. That's going to be food soon. And, tip from my friend, our local bakery sells sourdough starters for like a dollar fifty. Oh yeah. And they're super active. So if you're interested in sourdough, you can buy starters online. You could ask someone that already has a starter, like what I did, or maybe ask your bakery because they can let go of a tablespoon or whatever. This is a lot like the kombucha thing, right? Where you have to have a mother. Yep. It basically is like uh it's a living thing. It has to be nurtured and fed and used. Like all and, good food, basically. Yeah, it's living. And it's breaking down the gluten and making it super yummy. We don't know anything about sourdough, guys. We're, yeah, not, we can only learn so much. But I can say that we've kind of gotten away from grains and stuff in our diet. We don't have many. And part of that's just because typically it doesn't feel good uh, with digestion, which makes me particularly bitter because I like pizza. But we've learned to make pizza with things like coconut flour, almond flour and stuff. But you know what I'm talking about? There's nothing like a really good, a really good pizza crust. And so Alyssa has been exploring for a long time food and how to use fermentation and things to make food more digestible. So we're hopefully gonna be using sourdough to bring some of these, these flours and grains and things back in our diet, but in a way that is more digestion friendly. There's a book I've linked to in the past, it's called Nourishing Traditions, I'll link to it below the video. But they actually talk about how a lot of grain has or has like digestive inhibitors it's in it. It's an enzyme, right? Right, it prevents you from digesting the very thing that you're eating. So when you ferment and soak, it's actually starting the digestive process so you can actually digest it. So it's almost a miracle that some people eat gluten without problems, I'm actually, one of those people, it's not like a catastrophe when I eat gluten. Right. But still, I would love to make it easier to digest. Yeah, I mean, when you want to feel good when you eat, not feel bad from your food. Right, I you don't want to not... feel like bloated and fat, you know. Yes, right. But it's about, yeah, feeling that way less often. Ooh, that's gonna be some yummy broth in about 24 hours.
Oof, two to go. That one and that one. That feels good, guys. We are killing it. It's been a long time coming, getting back inside and working on electrical. I got started on it the other night, as you guys know, and then ran into roadblocks. The good news is we have a solution. Don't worry, I plan on sharing that. So I've got the laundry or kitchenette or whatever you wanna call it all wired up. Outlets are in, switches are in. I don't have a light because, well, we're not sure what we're gonna do for cabinetry yet. The wire is just stubbed off. There's no power there. So we're not gonna put anything there. The dryer's already wired up, the washer's wired up. There's nothing keeping us from putting the washer and the dryer over in that corner, which will give us more space back here in the garage, which seems to always be a premium. I have just a couple of goals, but man, it, whenever I say that, it always sounds like, oh, no problem, we'll knock it out before noon, right? But those couple of goals seem to be fairly involved. Goal one is to backtrack where I was when I hot knifed this chase for the East Garage electrical circuit. We've got that figured out. We'll share that here in just a second, but I wanna get this wired up and actually get the refrigerator plugged into an actual circuit. We've got this silly electrical cord powering the refrigerator. That's gotta go. And the other thing is this guy right here. I wanna get the range hooked up. But again, that's a very layered goal. One of the things that I'm trying to do and I've been talking with the electricians about is think about way in the future. Don't do something today that would kind of cut us at the knees, you know, five years from now. And I'm kind of thinking about this space over here where we're currently using kind of as a living area, more like a shopish area or like a workspace. And what would I do with that way down the road? Part of what's going through my mind over here is that we may end up hooking up things like a welder or an air compressor or something that's gonna take some serious juice. So while I could wire this just for today, which would be the range, I wanna make sure that the, the, the wire that we're using back to the panel, the breaker at the panel, et cetera, are set up so that in the future, we would not have to pull another wire run. No, 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 no. Of course, there's this debate about how many outlets to put in, because everybody says, oh, you'll always want more outlets. So what do you put them, every six inches? I mean, what is the magic number? We all adapt. We're gonna probably end up doing about every four feet or so on this wall, because it's gonna be a workspace and it's not that any one device takes a lot of juice, but sometimes you just want a bunch of outlets and you don't really want those strip outlets. You guys know what I'm talking about. I got a couple of the really important tasks on my punch list done. One of those is marking this hot wire, this little red mark right here. This is the second hot leg on the bathroom heater. If you guys remember, this is 240 volts. And so this white wire is not a neutral and it's really important for myself and any future person who touches that wire to realize that's not a neutral wire, it's a hot wire. And the code says that you have to use a durable marking. That's what it says. So I just wrapped everywhere that this wire can be accessed, I wrapped it in red electrical tape. I'm glad I had that lesson because I can't tell you how many times in past homes I've taken something apart and I looked at a white wire and I just assumed that it was neutral. And I see now that if, if somebody was doing their wiring and maybe you didn't know what you were looking at because the visible difference between a 110 volt heater and a 240 volt heater it's not much, they really don't look different. But the difference in touching that white wire, if it's a neutral and a hot, is a really big difference. We finally rounded up some nice cover plates to tidy up the bathroom. I decided to go with metal. A lot of people have complained that these crack over time and we thought we'd go with something a little bit more durable, maybe a little bit more washable. Because this is a garage, this thing's gonna get a lot of greasy fingerprints on it. So hopefully these will last us a long time. And I did just a little bit of kind of mm, touch up. We'll call it touch up. How's that? <laughs> to make this thermostat look a little bit more tidy. As you guys know from my electrician's visit, I have so many things on my punch list to do, and some of them are easy, and some of them are very layered. And right now, we're actually still trying to get moved in, 
and right now we're also trying to get some of the space back in the garage. So if this whole video series or whatever you want to call it, this, this documenting process, if it feels like we're inside, we're outside, we're upstairs, we're downstairs, we're inside, we're outside, it's because we are. And there's just, we're, we're kind of working on what makes sense day to day. We can't simply just put our head in the sand and work on something until it's done. We've got to kind of look outside, how's the weather, look at our energy, look at our time, and make decisions. So that's kind of why we're a little helter-skelter. for a poor man's hot knife. Nice. Perfect. That's looking really good guys. Sitting nice and flush with the ICF and there's actually somewhere around a half an inch of insulation still behind the box. And if we wanted to be super anal, we could shoot foam in around the box here and really keep the R value and the insulation pretty high. And here is the secret that we found to our box problem. A lot of guys already guessed this who are around electrical and around sheetrock and stuff. This little thing is called a mud ring or a plaster ring and it does exactly what you think it does. So these boxes are actually genius because they're basically universal. They'll do a million different things. You just need to add the right ring. So this guy furs out the depth of the box for sheetrock. That's awesome because instead of needing 50 different boxes, you only need one box. And then, depending on the depth of your sheetrock, you buy the appropriate mud ring. You can also buy single gang, double gang, all kinds of options for mud rings that all fit one junction or J box. Simple, right? Usually that's the answer. So this is what we're gonna to use to make these shallow boxes fit the ICFs. So this box is one and a half inches deep, and then this will end up being a 5 8 deep mud ring because we're gonna be using 5 8 sheetrock for fire code, which will be a one hour uh, fire on the inside of the garage. That's just the garage. That's not necessary in the living area. I love this idea because maybe in one room, you want to use half inch sheetrock and you can put the appropriate mud ring on there, but you could buy a huge chunk of these boxes and do all kinds of different things. There's another advantage to these boxes and that is that the mud ring can actually be rotated. It doesn't fit just one direction. Why would you want that? Well, think about different outlet locations. So this is going to be our range outlet, but not this box. But imagine this box were on the floor and we put the outlet vertically because we have to because of the orientation of the screw holes. Well, that sucks because the, art or the cord for the range is gonna be really rigid and it's gonna wanna hit the floor. So maybe we wanna rotate this outlet to the side so that the cord actually runs horizontally along the wall and the mud ring allows you to do that. Whereas you would not be able to do that with this box because of where the flange is located. If you had to turn this box and you had the flange down here, well, that's no good. So now I'm not only learning this is the solution, but I'm realizing the wisdom and the awesomeness behind this system of boxes. I'll share a little secret with you guys that I learned from the electrician. See all this imprinting on the back of the box? Up here at the top, you'll see a small number with a hyphen or a slash and a large number. 
This small number is the quantity of this number of wire that you're allowed to have in this box. So number 12 wire, we would be allowed eight of those wires. The ground is only counted one time. So if you have three ground wires, you only count that one time. So not including the ground, we could have 11 number, excuse me, we could have seven number 12 wires in this box. So if we have two outlets, that's gonna be two, a hot and a neutral, a hot and a neutral. So there's four. And then each outlet is considered two units. So this outlet is two, this outlet is two, that's four. So if we did that, we would be right on the edge of the number of number uh, 12 wires that were allowed. But wait, there's more. The way that number is calculated is based on the cubic inches of this box. So back here it says this is an 18 cubic inch box. And the funny thing is you can get an 18 cubic inch box in many different designs. Some of them are deep, some of them are wide, some of them are tall, etc. But when you add the mud ring, you're adding cubic inches. This mud ring actually adds six cubic inches. So instead of being an 18 cubic inch box, this is a 24 cubic inch box. And that means you can put more wires in the same box. I believe the reason for this cubic inch wire uh, limit is heat. So when you add a mud ring to a junction box like this, you actually can then add more wire into a smaller box, if you will. I asked the electrician, what happens when you get below wire size number 10? Because all of these boxes have 14, 12, and 10. And he said, well, there's a code for that, but it's not included in the box. And that's because these are the most common wire sizes. That's really helpful. Something else that he told me very early on when we talked to him is that you want to be putting these outlets, which are RV, I don't even know why I call them RVs, our 50 amp outlets for the range or the dryer in a double gang box because the wire size is so big that trying to fit it into a single gang box is just a nightmare. But when you go to a 50 amp outlet, which is what our range will be wired as, you actually have to go to a double gang box. I do wanna qualify all of this stuff. This is all in Idaho. This is our code, wherever you are, it's probably different, so talk to somebody who knows what they're doing. But I'm still learning all these little things about electricity, and I thought that little thing inside that box was a gem. It's obvious that there's more than one way to achieve this objective with the ICFs. We could have just used a, a, a narrow or a shallow depth box and red-hatted or tap-conned or whatever you want to call it into the concrete. That would have done the job too. What I like about this is that we're preserving about a half an inch of that insulation, which in the big picture, probably not gonna notice it on the energy bill, but it's insulation and that may help with condensation, moisture issues, right? Insulation is not all about heating your house. There's a lot of reasons to have it. We had talked about furring the wall out, we talked about framing a wall, and we just didn't really like the idea of those things. We'd also talked about running conduit, making everything kind of surface. We thought how silly for us to build a wall inside of our wall. It's not something we really wanted to do. A, you're losing square footage. B, it's more building materials. And if we're doing all of that just to mount a junction box or an electrical box, it seems not justified. As far as having everything on the surface and running conduit hither and thither, we want this area to look somewhat finished. It's actually a partial living area. Even though it's a garage, this side of the garage is more of work area, living area. Although with the timber frame and log home type construction, you may end up needing to use conduit and stuff like that because there may just not be a great way to hide wire. Something else the electrician pointed out is that typically with ranges, there are areas that are recessed. And he said the most common recessed area is actually along the bottom. And so when you put your outlet near the floor, two things, one, you wanna turn it sideways, 
and two, put it close to the floor because that way the range will actually go flush to the wall. If you put the cord or the outlet anywhere in here, here, or up here, you're gonna have to hold the range away from the wall, which most people don't like. So this range is recessed all along that side on the bottom and then up this side just a little bit. If we go two feet, I guess it would actually be on the left side, that's gonna be a pretty sweet spot and we should be able to mount the outlet vertically. Sweet, Alyssa's offered to help and jump in. So she's gonna work on hot knifing those chases for those wall outlets. I'm gonna jump to uh, getting the wire pulled for the range outlet. And I wanted to take just a moment and share something that I learned. Uh, way back when we did the SER, which I think stands for like service entrance, Never mind. I have no idea what it means. It's some sort of it's some sort of cable. It's the stuff that we ran through to our panel from the outside panel, and it's sheathed wire. It's sheathed cable. But I wanted to back up because we received quite a few messages about drilling the eye joists, and people were uh, a bit upset because of where we drilled the holes for the SER cable. And I thought I would share that I downloaded the guide for TJI joists, TJI joists. And this is a Weyerhaeuser product and they have an engineering guide. I think it's actually called a specifier's guide and it's for spans and loads and deflection and all this stuff. And they actually go over where you're allowed to drill holes in these guys. It's probably a little hard to see on camera, but there's actually this huge table and they show both the size, frequency, square, round, etc. And it's, of course, based on your joist. I think the most important thing about these joists is that they have a web, which is near the bearing area, which in our case is on top of the ICFs. It's a six inch by six inch area that is a no drill zone. And I'm not going to say that we're super smart people and that we knew we weren't drilling in a bad area. We actually didn't know that. What we relied on is the factory knockouts. And they were where, right where we drilled. So we figured if the factory knockout was there, we're probably safe to drill there. And it just so happens that we're outside of the 6 inch by 6 inch no drill zone. But there is a comment here that I think is really helpful. It says that you can drill an inch and a half anywhere in the webbing area that's not in the no drill zone. And that's, that's really helpful. So that gives you a lot of freedom. The thing is, it's all relative because then once you drill that hole, you now have to honor the spacing between that and the next hole. I'm only sharing this because it was something people were concerned about in our behalf, and I think it's good for people who are watching this channel to, to look for that resource. So download that guide if you guys are working on that and you don't already know about it. It demystifies how big of a hole you can drill and where. And I'll just say, if you haven't already seen that span table, it will shock you how large of a hole you can drill in these things and still not negatively impact their function. So this is number six wire and it's rated for 50 amps. And we just wanna get this through the joist. It's looking to me like we can actually probably just use a half inch drill bit. It's looking a little tight. Maybe better go to three quarter. You do love me. You're gonna let me down.
Oops, I disconnected Alyssa's internet. Let's see if that does the trick. Let me know if that turns it back on. That's exactly why we're getting this sorted out, guys. This one outlet right here. This little guy was the first outlet in our house, and he's been working pretty hard since the day we put him in, doing everything. Lights, internet, heat, all the above. So we ran into a problem <clears throat> with this uh, hot knifing area. These plastic studs that are in here are pretty resilient and that hot knife simply struggles to get through them. They're so strong and so deep. We gotta find a better way to widen that chase. Um, I did talk to the electrician about crossing the Romex with this number six wire and he gave me the green light but I think we're gonna end up having to nail plate across this area because the Romex is gonna to be too shallow in the wall. We may end up having to nail plate this whole thing for the same reason is it, it just doesn't go deep enough where a screw couldn't hit it. I think using a saw would probably obviously speed up the process, but it's going to make a horrific mess. Well, let's try this one more time. And we'll see if we can get success without making a huge mess. Well, the hot knife's definitely working. I was able to do about a third of this run so far, maybe a little over that, maybe half. Um, Alyssa's gonna take that over so I can focus on getting some of these outlets wired up. This is ready to wire up. We've just gotta deepen that wire a little bit. We're almost there. This is, this is getting close. This is kind of the, the bulk of it, and then we'll have to you know land everything at the panel, which is gonna take mm. a while. Here on the cruise. This is a perfect job for people that are fast, not accurate. <laughs> right? right? I've never seen in any ad for a hot knife anything about accuracy. <laughs> no. But, but it always mentions fast. It's just ish. Guaranteed, we'll get your hot knifing done in a hurry. Faster we're just not. We're just not sure it'll be exactly what you want. But I'll be doggone if it Damn, won't be quick. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for calling. Holy smokes, that's fast hot knifing. How can we help you? Wow, you're done already? Well, that's what we do here at Holy Smokes Hot Knifing. Well guys, this was not the plan for this outlet, but I don't see that we have a lot of choice here. We'll, we'll need to fix this. I just kind of cobbled together a few parts I had for other projects. This is a box extension, which you can add to a junction box to do exactly what I did here, add depth. And then you can add the mud ring. Well, the <laughs> mud ring's kind of pointless at this stage here but it provides a place to attach this outlet. But that number six wire is not going in that inch and a half box. 
on a 50 amp outlet. It's not gonna happen. So this will work for tonight. We'll get this cover plate on. Alyssa helped me tag team these outlets. We now have five outlets on this wall. We should have put a sixth in there. I just wasn't paying attention. And uh, well, we'll just do it another day. It's not a big deal to add one. Of course, this circuit is gonna get extended over and up and around and down. And we'll end up becoming the exterior circuit for outside and inside. I think sometimes like these projects, this is validation for me because I feel like sometimes it's hard for me to get started on a project because on the to-do list, it says hook up garage outlets, right? Easy peasy, except for that could be hours and you never know what problems like the ICF and hot knifing and the, the junction box depth and all that stuff you're gonna run into. It's just an unknown. And what we've kind of learned is that our to-do list, not everything on the list is equal, even though each thing only takes up one line. So take out the garbage and wire garage outlets take the same amount of space on the to-do list, but they certainly don't take the same amount of time and effort. I'm done for tonight. It's been a long day. We've kind of been doing this in small stages and I think we just need to get some sleep. We're really close. This is pretty much done for now. It'll get the refrigerator on tonight, which we can, we can do that. So that's progress. That's one extension cord gone. The washer and dryer is pretty much ready, except for I have to land all these wires that I've been pulling back at the panel. And it's just too late to be turning the power off. And what if something goes wrong and then there's more problems and now we're losing even more sleep? Why? Why do that to ourselves? But I would say this is actually a huge win. Maybe not today, but tomorrow, tomorrow, we'll have pizza. I mean, what are we making? Tortillas? I show them. Oh, you wanna show them? I have been smelling this for over two hours. So this is going to be pasta. Three wow. ingredients. Flour, mm -hmm. water, and egg yolk. Okay. And it's more than doubled in size already and yeah. just sitting for a couple of hours. Is that what you were hand kneading? Yep. That's one of Seymour's progeny, right? Yep. Or Seymour Jr.? Yeah, I'm gonna just call him Jr. for short. We'll call him Jr. Call and him Jay. And behind curtain B, we uh -huh. have tortillas. Ooh. This one hasn't expanded nearly as much. No, it hasn't, huh? I don't know why. But we've used okay. all the sourdough, all mm -hmm. of it, except yep. for a tablespoon which I fed and we're already brewing our next batch. Nice. I know we can't eat it this quick, Sure. but I'm really excited about it. So worst case we get too much and we, you know, make something for friends or something. Looks like power's back on. Ready? Yep, or should we just go straight back? Yep, just push straight back, yep. Do we wanna hide the outlet? Yep. And then we wanna angle it that way in here? Okay. Any success? Yeah, no. Angle it back in. Okay. That'll work. A day when we get rid of one extension cord is a good day. It is, less tripping hazards. <laughs> 